A surprise attack by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor forced America into a war that they wanted nothing to do with. I'm Wyatt Roos, and this is History's Iconic Moments. Let the show begin. Now there isn't a person who was alive at the time that will ever forget where they were when they heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And we were just playing out in the yard and we heard the whole thing and everybody got all excited and worried. And... I was with a group of buddies. We were in a, a theater in Waterbury, Connecticut. I was uh, uh, living in Holland Park, Michigan. And then Pearl Harbor happened. I was working at Eastman Kodak and we were building timers for anti-aircraft shells. I was in Athens, Greece. It was a Sunday morning, uh, afternoon, and a group of the, my neighbor boys, uh, we were at uh, North Hollywood Junior High School, uh, playing football, touch football. And uh, a guy comes up in a car and he stops right at the fence. I thought he was just going to watch the game. He kept hollering at us to come over. So we came over and he says, you kids better get home. He says, we're at war. I was still in high school and was really quickly realized that we were very vulnerable. That on the West Coast, we had nothing. We had no army, no air force. The Navy was at the bottom, bottom of the ocean. So it didn't look very good. I was going to school in Johnson City and I came home on a Sunday noon after church at the Dexter's home where I was staying. And uh, there it was on the radio about we had been bombed at Pearl Harbor. I was on Mississippi Street in San Diego and uh, the guy with the, the paper boy was coming up and down the street selling papers. When Pearl Harbor happened, we had just come back from church. That was there in Glendale. And uh, my father had something to do, with, he caught it on the radio that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. So I always start off my interviews asking where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor, but you were actually there, weren't you? Right. Right, okay. Right, right aboard the West Virginia. So how did you not only survive Pearl Harbor and World War II, and then also you're, what, 96? 97. 97. So you, how, how did you make it that long? My faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. The power of the Holy Spirit is what guided me in everything I did and said. Wow. Thank you for taking your time out with you me bet. today. I appreciate it. You bet, Wyatt. November 26, 1941, the Japanese set sail for Hawaii. Their goal was to take out the American fleet before America decided to join the war against them. The plan was to take 420 aircraft, most of which would be the attack wave, but some would stay back for defensive measures. The Japanese commanders had set levels of importance for the Japanese pilots. Carriers were the first objective, cruisers the second, and battleships the third. The night before, I had been roller skating with my girlfriend, Juanita Suarez, and her mother came and picked us up, and she brought me back to the dock about 11.30, and when I was getting out of the car, she said, Stuart, would you like to go on a picnic with Juanita and her sister and I tomorrow on the north end of the island? I said, I'd love it. So she said, well, you'll be here at the dock 9.30 tomorrow morning, and uh, we'll pick you up. Well, you know, it never materialized. It was early morning, December 7th, when Minnie and Pearl were still waking up because I got up at five o'clock that morning 
and I showered and shaved, got my clothes all on and everything, and I was shining my white skates. I have Chicago roller skates, white shoes, and I put batteries because I had important run starboard running lights on my skates. And uh, while I was doing that, I looked down under my locker and my dress shoes were gone. So I asked one of the fellows in the compartment, I says, hey, did you by any chance see my dress shoes? Oh yeah, Pete Hartley wore them last night. Well, Pete Hartley's 32 years in the Navy, first class bosom mate, tattooed from one end to the other. And I said, well, where is he? He's in the after steering, sleeping. I got to go down five decks to get the after steering. So I got down there, and there he is, dead, drunk, and sound asleep. So I took my shoes off from him, and I'm walking out, and the quartermasters have their compartment right there. And uh, Cherry, he, he was a third class quartermaster, friend of mine, he said, Stu, how about having a cup of coffee? So I said, sure. So we were sitting there and we were sharing what we were gonna do that day. And uh, it's now about uh, five minutes to eight or so. And all of a sudden we hear the word of the loudspeaker, awake fire and rescue party. So that meant there was a fire somewhere. Shortly before 8 a.m., all hell broke loose. Man-made hell, made in Japan. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. So I ran all the way up those five decks to my locker, and when I opened up my locker, I got kicked right in the seat of the pants by a first-class boatsmate, Hicks. Headley, get to your battle station on a double. This is the real thing. I grabbed my hat, and that's quite a shocker for a 20-year-old brat. And I ran on it topside, and our teakwood decks was splintering. And I noticed our pilot, Lieutenant White, Lieutenant Commander White, underneath the gun tub, it'd like be underneath that desk there, and there's a gun on top of it. He's shooting with a 45. Now, I'm a seaman. He's a lieutenant commander. I'm wondering what kind of war is this? And I'm not about to ask any questions. So he said, son, where's your battle station? And I pulled her right up to her three, get up there as fast as you can. So I ran across the deck, and as I was going up the ladder to go into the right side of the turret, here come a Japanese torpedo plane down at port side. And I could see the pilot, the co-pilot, Raiderman, laughing like everything. And their machine gun, wing machine guns were spitting out 50 caliber bullets all over the place. So managed to get inside the turret, went down into the pit where my battle station was, gun pointer. Krausen and I were the only two that manned the right gun. Normally there's 12 men. Now where the gun captain went and the rammer and all them, I don't know where they went. And so there's 12 men to each gun, and we're separated by four inches of steel, the two guns. And right by my feet is a hatch 
big enough for a man to crawl through from one side to the other. It's called a manhole cover. So uh, when I get to this part, when I go out to the schools to speak, I digress for a minute and I ask him, uh, I take a chair and I sit in the chair and I ask him, how many of you like to lean back on the back two legs of a chair? Hands go up all over the place. Yeah, me too. I was nine years old right after grandma died. I had to go live with my dad again. And my father, being a lieutenant commander, you said yes sir and no sir in our house. And uh, my dad only spoke twice, third time he acted. So here I am in the kitchen, leaning back on the chair. My dad walked in, he said, Stuart, they made four legs on a chair to sit on the floor. Yes, sir. But how quick a nine-year-old forgets. So here I am, leaning back again. My dad walked in, Stuart, I'll not tell you again. Yes, sir. In this ear and right out that ear. So the next time I was leaning back, my dad walked in the kitchen, kicked the back leg out from underneath me. I cracked my head on the floor. I said, there's got to be a better way. So now when you see me sitting in a chair like that, my feet are back up underneath me. Well, that's a habit I learned at nine that saved my life at 20. If my feet had been out on the platform that I normally would have had them on, if we were going to fire those 16 inch, I would have no legs or I wouldn't be alive. Because while we were in our position, we, we were sitting there, we could hear the machine gun bullets hitting the turret, and we felt the thud of a torpedo, and the ship lurched. And uh, so Crosland said, Stu, let's see what's going on. Well, we have a bar that goes right across in front of us. It's a periscope. And you look through that bar, and there, the periscope is outside the turret. You can see for miles behind, just as clear as day. Well, we no sooner looked through that than, bam, there went the Arizona. And I estimated about 32 bodies went flying through the air. And uh, I thought a bomb went down the stack and broke the ship in half. But I later, later learned that an armor-piercing shell from a high-level bomber went through the starboard side of the forecastle, right down through the five steel decks, right into number one handling room. And there's a thousand bags of 100-pound bags of powder in each one of those handling rooms. Well, that went off. Then turret two went off. And that killed 1,177 men instantly. It was about three to five minutes later, there's an explosion in our turret. And because my feet were up behind me, that hatch, when it blew off those four steel dogs, it tore my foot pedals off, went underneath the elevating screw, tore Crosland's foot pedals off, and landed against the barbette, picking both of us up simultaneously and throwing us eight feet back into the elevating screw. Well, when we picked ourselves up off the deck, Crosby said, Stu, let's get out of here, when he didn't say it quite that nice. So we made a beeline, and I had the JA phones on, and when I got to the primer deck, I had ran out of the cord. And in my excitement, I just grabbed the hold of the belt, snapped it in half, threw it down in the pit, and never gave it another thought, except I tried stretching one of those belts for 20 years. I couldn't break it. And I never could understand why I was able to break it that day. 
till after I got out of the Navy. Then I found out. Well, <clears throat> when we hit topside, we were on about a 15 degree list. And I thought for sure we we're going to capsize. But nevertheless, curiosity killed the cat. We stood there and we watched the Oklahoma capsize. And during that time, my commanding officer, who we didn't know at the time, was mortally wounded. And the last words he ever uttered was, abandon ship. She's no longer any good to us. And he died in Dory Miller's arms. Well, Ensign Sears, a junior officer of the 3rd Division, was between the mast and the turret and screaming for us to get over on the Tennessee. Tennessee was inboard of us. And all of our lines were taught from our listing. However, five of our buddies that were jimmying across one of the breast lines got machine gunned. All five of them toppled in between the ship. And I told Quasin, we don't go over any lines. How are we going to get over there, Stu? I said, I don't know, but we'll find a way. And I said, by the way, Quasin, if I don't get killed today, I'll live to see the end of the war. How can you stay, say that, Stu? I said, if you have the faith to believe it, you can do it. He said, I don't have that kind of faith. Well, I went aboard the USS San Francisco. He went aboard the USS Honolulu. On February 12, 1942, he was killed. A torpedo came through the bow of the ship. He was in his bunk, and he was crushed with the steel. So, uh, while we were standing there on the quarterdeck, the Admiral's plane was upside down, the pontoon in the air, and it was burning. On top of gun three, or uh, the right gun of turret three, is a catapult, which I call the slingshot. And our SO2 scout observation was on the platform. And the top wing is the gas tank. And we always kept them filled to maximum for any emergency. Well, just forward of the scout observation was Admiral's plane, which was known as the Kingfish. It was a bi-wing. I mean, a, a single wing. And the armor-piercing shell hit the wing of the scout observation. That gasoline just literally exploded and burnt the plane to a crisp, split the catapult in half, came down through five inches of steel of the overhead on the left gun, and over top of these guns, we have a cylinder that would be just about the length of that couch and about that circumference. And it's filled with glycerin. So that when we fire that cannon, it comes right back to ready to load, doesn't oscillate. Well, it split that casing. And that flash fire just parboiled 11 men beyond recognition. And then it also blew the hatch off. It tore my pedals off. Well, while we were standing on the quarter deck, I said, Crosen, did you ever go down or walk, run down a railroad track? What are you talking about, Stu? I said, did you ever walk? I, I probably did when I was a kid. Why? I said, we're going to do it today. He says, what do you mean? I said, see that gun barrel? It's a 25, uh, um, five inch 38 that the anti-aircraft gun 
that the Marines use in the casemate. I said, see that gun barrel? It's about that big around. We're going to go up in the Marine casemate on the starboard side, climb up on that gun barrel, and run across and jump down in the Tennessee. You go first. Okay. So I did. And where do you think this idiot was going? Right back up into turret three. I got on the third rung of the ladder, and a Marine lifted me off with his foot. Haven't you had enough of those turrets? Well, what, what do you want us to do? Get over on the beach. I says, how? Swim, you idiot. Fire was about three times as high as this building of the oil that was on the water from the Nevada, the Arizona, the West Virginia, Oklahoma, the California all around the battleships to the shoreline. So I went over on the starboard side of the Tennessee. Here's all these nice, neatly piled clothes and shiny shoes. So I said, Crosden, strip down to your undershorts. And I said, we're going to jump in. We're not going to dive. And we had to jump from the height, probably the height of my house, down maybe even a little higher than that, down to the water. Well, we went as deep as we could. Now, when I went through boot training, I qualified A, B, C swimmer. That's the Austrian crawl and the breaststroke and swimming on your back and floating, but not underwater swimming. But I guarantee you I swam underwater that morning. And between here and my fence out there is about as far as we had to go to the shoreline. We broke surface twice. The hottest breath of air I ever breathed in my life. It's only by the grace of God that my Lungs didn't get scorched. As soon as we hit the beach, an ambulance picked us up and rushed us right to the dispensary. And when we walked into the dispensary, there's a great big red cross right in the center of the floor because it's like a Spanish uh, patio all open. And there's a walkway with a banister all the way around. And when we got up there, why, they were already using cots and beds and tables, anything they could put a body on. Well, they examined both Cross and I, and we didn't have any bleeding or any sores or anything. However, we were covered with oil. I put on three suits of khaki before I could wear one. The fourth one was the one I got. This. We were like a blotter. When you put on the khaki, the oil just saturated. So uh, they found that we didn't have any problem. So they said, you're going to help these men here. So they gave us a tube of ungentine ointment to put on the burns. They gave us a jar of sulfur drug to put into the wounds. And then they gave us canisters of morphine to minister to those that were in dire pain and dying. With those three items, we saved lives. Well, it's now getting to be about 925. Now, I had no idea of the schedule, but there were supposedly three uh, sorties that Fushida had planned. The first was to destroy the battle fleet. The second was to polish up what the first didn't get. And the third was to destroy the submarine base, all of our oil tanks above ground, and the repair base. 
when this plane, these two planes were approaching, and I saw them, I yelled, duck. We went under chairs and tables, and any place we could get to the floor. Glass just shattered all over the place. And one of the planes, when he lifted up, dropped a bomb that tore that Red Cross right out of existence. So when everything cleared away, the dust, we looked over the banister and there was no speck of red anywhere. Well, a chief told Cross and Headley that you're wanted back aboard ship to fight fire. So they took us in a truck and took us out in the dock, put us in a boat, took us back to the ship. Now our ship had started to level up because what we didn't know was there was a young ensign who grabbed 10 men, went through the starboard side of the ship, opening all the sea valves, flooding the compartments on the starboard side to counteract the flooding on the port from the torpedoes. So when I got aboard, Chief said, Headley, you're going to handle the hose for the executive officer. Now I'm going to put you, how old are you? 33. No, you weren't born yet, were you? No. So you wouldn't know. Well, anyhow, uh, Richard Helen Cotter was our executive officer. And I was assigned to hold the hose for him, and he was to operate the nozzle. Well, when he cracked the hatch going into the third division compartment, boom, boom! And I thought, the Japanese are back. But it wasn't. The heat was so intense in the compartment that the minute the air went in there, it blew our portholes right out. And uh, took 45 minutes to cool that compartment down. We got hit with two bombs, one that went through the turret and one that went through the galley and the marine casemate. And uh, on board ship, we usually painted about every 30 days. Uh, our angle irons had about eight, nine coats of paint on them. And that's what developed the heat, the burning of that paint and stuff. And we had linoleum decks called red decks. And uh, so when we finished cooling down the compartment, I asked our executive officer, I said, uh, could I check my locker? Go right ahead. So I opened up my locker, and there's my blues, my dungarees, my pea coat, my sweaters, my hats, my underwear, one pair of shoes, my sneakers, everything, just like I left them. The minute you touch them, they turn to ashes, disintegrated. So I opened my bottom drawer, and oh man, I was sick. I had over three or four hundred photographs that I'd taken while I was out there. And when you take a picture at that date, date, date you have a film so rolled up inside the can and put it in a canister. And uh, so I had all the film and I had the pictures, and it was just one mass of goo. So then I learned to send my pictures home from that time on. But anyhow, everything in that bottom drawer was shot. So then I opened the top drawer, and uh, I had bought a pearl buckle because I used to make Belfast cord belts, square knot. 
the belt was disintegrated, but the pearl buckle was just a little bit tarnished. And alongside of it was a half penny. Now I have to go back because in October of 41, the British battleship War Spite came into the Pearl. And uh, we were volunteered to go over and fraternize with the British sailors and uh, make friends and stuff like that. Well, they were given out trinkets and little items that they had, you know, as souvenirs. So the fellow I was with, he told me, he says, I don't have much to give you, but come on down to my locker and we'll see what I can find. So he had these half pennies. They're about the size of a half dollar. And uh, he handed me one of those, and when he did, he said, you know, it won't be too long before you'll be in this war with us. I said, no, I said, we'll supply you with tanks and ammunition, planes, but I don't think we'll be in a war. And I thought to myself, when I opened up that drawer and saw the half penny, what a prophecy. So. About 4.30, 5 o'clock, they put us in a boat and took us over to Bach Recreation Center. There they gave us a suit of uh, dungarees and a blanket and a pillow. And uh, they fed us some sandwiches and tea. And we settled down at about 6.30, to go to sleep, and all of a sudden we heard rat a tat rat a tat tat machine gun fire. And we thought, oh no, they're back. So we later found out what it was. The Enterprise, which was late in getting back to Pearl, was sending their planes in to land at Fort Island. And they thought there were enemy planes and they were shooting at them. So as it turned out, why I think we shot down four of the planes and all four of the pilots escaped. And uh, so then the next morning, Saturday morning, uh, they were telling us you're going to be put in a draft and you're going to go to different ships. But we just relaxed Monday. They gave us a card, and on it said, I am well, and all you could do is sign it. Nothing more to be just at home. Some of the losses for America. The Arizona was hit by four armor-piercing bombs and sunk, killing 1,177 men. The Oklahoma was hit by five torpedoes and capsized. The West Virginia was hit by two bombs, seven torpedoes, sunk, but returned to service in July of 44. So then uh, Tuesday, the 9th, they got us all lined up on the dock, and they segregated us into groups. And uh, there were about 42 of us from the West Virginia that ended up on the USS San Francisco. And while we were standing on the dock, the commanding officer, Captain Daniel J. Callahan, uh, was greeting us. And he said, uh, shipmates, I want to welcome you all aboard. He said, uh, we're going to do away with Navy protocol, and we're going to operate the ship on two principles. We're going to anticipate what's going to happen, and when it does, we're going to improvise. That's how we brought that ship back to the States. It was literally pulverized with 14-inch shells. 
out of Guadalcanal. The California was hit by two bombs and two torpedoes, sunk but returned to service in January of 44. In all, 2,335 servicemen were killed, 1,143 servicemen wounded, 188 planes damaged, 159 planes destroyed, 68 civilians killed, 35 civilians wounded. Some of the Japanese losses include but are not limited to 29 planes being shot down, 129 men killed, and one man captured. Now, I would not want to be the one guy that gets captured after an attack of this nature. December 8, 1941, U.S. Congress declares war on the Empire of Japan. The Japanese attack did in fact inflict heavy damage to the Americans, but it failed to strike the decisive blow that they had planned. A few days later, Germany and Italy declared war on America. The world was once again at war, and World War II had begun for America. The attack on Pearl Harbor was a tactical victory for the Empire of Japan, but after the war's end, it was looked at as a war crime in the Tokyo trial. 28 Japanese military officials and political leaders were put on trial. All 28 Japanese officials were charged with 55 separate charges. Of the 28 defendants, two died during the proceedings and one was ruled unfit to stand trial. The rest of the 25 defendants were all found guilty on at least one count. The sentencing ranged from seven years in prison to execution. The attack on Pearl Harbor will never be forgotten. It went on to cost the Americans 407,316 men killed, 671,278 men wounded by the end of the war. And that is why the attack on Pearl Harbor is one of history's iconic moments. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming episodes of History's Icons. Please consider supporting this program at patreon.com slash unsungheroestv. Thanks so much. I'm Wyatt Roos, and I will see you guys next time. Oh